Welcome to Revenue Talks, the show where we get real about what it takes to build pipeline and drive expansion as a go-to-market team. I'm Justin Keller, the Vice President of Revenue Marketing at Drift, and on this show, I'm here talking to folks across the entire go-to-market organization, which means marketing, sales, and customer success, about how they use conversations, technology, and cross-functional alignment to build more pipeline and drive expansion. Because revenue, it's everyone's business now. Hello, welcome back to Revenue Talks. I'm Justin, and today I could not be more stoked than to have David Malmberg joining me. David is the Vice President of Marketing uh, at Navadi, which is a company focused on employee mental health and well-being, which is something I'm actually really enthusiastic about myself, having spent some time at an employee well-being company myself. So um, excited to click in on that. David also yeah. made our top marketers to a watch list this year. So if you haven't checked that out in the blog, thank uh, you. make sure you do so. Thank you. I mean, congrats. Um, and for those listening, link is in the show notes uh, down there below. Well, depending on where you're listening to this, it's, it's somewhere around this podcast. <laughs> um, so today I want to talk to David about a, a particularly big and nebulous topic, which is brand affinity. And I think if, you know, outsiders think of brand affinity as a marketing responsibility. But I think if you're listening to this podcast, you're in the know, and you know it's way bigger than that. Brand affinity is yeah. an entire company thing. So um, listen in as we chat about how he manages cross-functional relationships to create a consistent customer experience that people love and make love the brand. So let's get into it. Um, David, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure. I'm I'm excited to be here. Uh, honored to be on, on the list you guys have for this year. And uh, yeah, really excited to talk to you. I, it's going to be a great conversation. I, I'm, I, let's get into it. I, I can't wait either. <laughs> so let's start with the biggie, uh, brand affinity, which yeah. is obviously important to a lot of companies, right? But I imagine that this is probably particularly important to Navadi because Navadi, you know, being an employee wellness um, app, you, you likely sell into, you know, uh, HR, employee engagement, some, some you know, uh, department, but you're not mm -hmm. actually selling that's not the end experience, right? Your product is yeah. ultimately experienced by every employee, right? You know, we we kind of live with the concept that uh, every employee is kind of a marketer. Um, and we try to make it that way where we have every employee feel comfortable in understanding like what it is we're doing, why it's important. Um, and then we try to stay pretty in sync with uh, with what everybody's doing and, and what those touch points actually look like. And, you know, this concept of brand affinity really originated, uh, I got I, I'd say a really close education on it from um, uh, the previous company as I was running a marketing agency, I was with a marketing agency called Struck and, and they really kind of hang on this concept of, of what brand affinity is. And I had the task when we were really kind of trying to figure out, you know, how do you define brand affinity? How do you quantify brand affinity? Like there's kind of four primary components that we went down um, to, to try to label and understand what brand affinity actually was. And um, we tried to figure out a way to quantify what that was. But like one of the first and primary themes that's in central for there to be actually brand affinity for any company, for that matter, is really having a, a purpose behind that brand. And, and, you know, I think we're blessed in the fact that mental health um, is really kind of one of those topics that a lot of people can get behind, but it, it gives us an opportunity to really drive our purpose. Uh, and that's such an important part. In, in what we do and, and an important part in how we, we focus our marketing efforts too. So, yeah, I think that is, I don't know if I would call it a luxury, but it's, it's definitely helpful to you to have a, a mission driven company. You're, you're trying to do something yeah. good in the world, which makes it easy for people to line up uh, against it. So many B2B marketers don't have that luxury and have to try and convince the world to fall in love with their, their widget that makes, you know, efficiency 10% better. And, you know, it's a good thing. Um, sure. no, no shade, but they don't get the luxury. They don't, they don't have the ability to like really drive that brand affinity the way. But I think it's that said, not impossible, right? You can, you can make people fall in love For with the sure. brand. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's where some of the other elements really come into play. So the like, kind of going back to what we created at Struck, like the, the four primary components of brand affinity was like having a purpose. We're lucky mental health. Um, it's a mental health app. I guess maybe I could back up. Navadi is a mental health app, a, a mental health benefit for employers. Um, and we provide a variety of different tools to proactively like help and support employees and their mental health needs. Um, 
And and so we have a purpose uh, where we have a very mission oriented goal when it comes to our marketing efforts. But the other components really can drive uh, brand affinity equally. And and that's what we call design performance. Um, and what that means is actually having the the component, the product, the experience designed well from top to bottom. Every interaction has got a design uh, component behind it. Uh, having an audience experience. Um, one of my comp- favorite aspects of marketing, and I've never actually worked for a consumer company. This is kind of the weird part behind it, but like my favorite component of marketing is actually the unboxing event. Like what does yeah. that event actually look like when somebody first touches your product? Um, and, and I think that can be such a powerful uh, marketing experience. And so that audience experience is really good. And then uh, key to like any other marketing uh, or or really you know, touch point that you have with a customer is is making sure that you have the opportunity to get proper feedback from that customer and, and making sure you understand what the voice and the perception of that experience is with the customer. So th- that's where like survey data and, and whatnot can be really valuable. So maybe, maybe purpose might be a little bit tougher for what you're doing, but I don't even think that's impossible. Like you look at some of these brands that people really love, Patagonia, for better or worse, like they've really driven a purpose around nature or whatever that may be um, because of their outdoor uh, gear. And, and every company can kind of find what that purpose is. But if purpose is maybe the weakest part to your brand affinity experience, there, there's a lot you can do around the design and the experience and making sure you're collecting that customer feedback. I think that's right on. And I think I, I love, I totally agree that un- unboxing experience is amazing. And I think it's something that maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe marketers aren't thinking enough about because you can approximate or kind of find an analog for a lot of B2C experiences in B2B. And I think, you know, for mm-hmm. you guys, it's probably when you roll it out to the ultimate, you know, the, the employee group that's going to be getting this benefit. But how much of that is marketing driven? How much of that's product driven? I I, I, mean, I, pres- I presume the answer is both. But, you know, if that's true, how do you get those things to line up? Yeah, yeah. So that's where it's really important that you have uh, great communication across the board. So I have very consistent um, and deliberate sync up meetings with our product team, our customer support team, our sales team, and, and really making sure that I have an understanding of what they're doing. Uh, I do, you know, and, and even our, our provider team. So like our provider of, of, of experts or our network of providers, such as like counselors and nutritionists and, and, and yoga instructors and all of that. Um, the, director of our clinical operations, like I'm in touch with her quite a bit as far as like understanding, you know, what I'm saying, does that resonate well? Like, do the providers respond well? Um, Like, would they understand if I started saying things this way? And I make sure I have very clear language in in what we're saying from a marketing perspective. And then I make sure that that language translates very well to what the product experience actually is. And and in fact, um, you know, our our product director and myself, we've been going back and forth quite a bit uh, as we are reworking you know, just at a at a fundamental level, like how we talk about what our product is and the benefits that come about it and, and why it's important and, and making sure that the it's all clinically backed by, you know, what the experts are actually saying. Gotcha. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, it, we'll, we'll talk about sales and marketing work together, together in a minute, but I think that the marketing, especially when your product touches a, you know, I think probably scales with the number of, of people that your product touches, marketing and product being in lockstep is so critical to that brand affinity and making sure that it feels like a cohesive experience. If they're yeah. completely disjointed, right? Like it's, it's almost like you're being lied to. Yeah, for sure. I, that's, that's really important. It's like, what I want as as the head of marketing is I want the first touch experience that they have, whether it's, you know, at a conference or the website or, or maybe some, you know, event where we spoke at uh, whatever that first touch experience was like, they should be able to recognize that's the same company when they sign up into our app and actually start using the app. And it's like, yeah, same company that I started here is the same company I'm working with here. And, and it, you know, it sounds weird. Like that sounds such like a, like an obvious thing to say and, and want, but really, the reality is, is a lot of people don't actually have that experience from end to end um, with a lot of products. I think that shows up particularly viciously when you've got a a a, a, a very pressured demand gen marketer whose job is to just get people into the app or get people to fill out the form and completely detaches themselves from the product experience. And I feel like that's where you get these overhyped marketers. Um, that you you can tell like this is not an authentic marketing experience. And I think that's what we're getting at, right? Like I think where we're circling is that genuine brand experience sure. is the thing that creates the affinity. 
Yeah, yeah. It and that that experience from top to bottom is what creates that affinity and it's important. And it's totally understandable when you get a marketer who's kind of maybe siloed or or like they have one goal and that goal is to make sure their Google Ads campaigns is running as efficiently as possible. And and you know, you want those people who have those very like deep in-depth knowledge and experience on whatever channel or or technology that they're asked to deploy and, and manage over. Uh, and that's really good. At, at, at the executive level within the marketing department, though, you got to make sure that that orchestration is there, that they understand um, that that person has to take ownership of like what it is that we talk about, how we talk about, um, and and kind of what those touch points look like and make sure that that's well understood to the individual who's, in, you know, neck deep in, in Google AdWords. So. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. And if you can make that great experience, then, you know, ideally that becomes revenue, right? And so let's yeah, maybe take yeah. the conversation there is talking about our, our relationship with our friends over in sales who um, sure. we love because they're they're listening to this conversation too, David, FYI. Um, I did, and acknowledging that there's one or two salespeople listening to this, you, you said <laughs> on another podcast that marketing is an asset to sales. And before our yeah. sales friends get to uh, wound around the axle on that, I think you, you came from a good place in saying it, saying that, you know, like at the end of the day, marketing is in service of say, marketing is in the service of building pipeline and revenue, right? Which is a way of saying, hey, yeah. we're here to help you mar the sales team, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so I have, I, I don't think this is a unique opinion, but like the way I look at marketing I look at marketing as a sales team, right? We're, we're a macro sales team versus a micro sales team. Um, and that's really what the difference is between marketing and sales is, is the macro level uh, of communication versus the micro level of communication. When that is done right, though, um, and you're kind of looking at that, that, again, just going to the alignment of what's being said at the macro level matches what's being said at the micro level with the actual sales team. I do consider, especially right now, like we're we're a pretty young company and revenue is incredibly important to us. And so we need to make sure that we are are getting sales and, and people on board with with our company and and uh, enjoying the product that they're having um, with us. But I look at us as being kind of a necessary service department for sales, um, especially at this level. I want to make it as easy as possible for the sales team to accomplish their goals, whatever the case may be. So the sales team will come to me and say, hey, I really need a, a calculator so people can understand what the ROI is when they sign up for you know, our product. And so my number one goal at that point is like, hey, is that going to make your conversations a lot easier? Then the number one thing I'm doing right now is making you an ROI calculator. Come to find out three, four weeks later, like I build an ROI calculator and it's not necessarily sending the message that they were expecting it to send for one reason or another. Like they don't believe it. The source of data is not quite there. The calculation might be off, whatever the case may be is like, I'm there to fix it and make sure that that works for them. Uh, we're going to go to a conference next week and um, I need to make sure that the sales team has the assets that they need so that they can have a conversation, whether it's in a PowerPoint format that they can pull up on their iPad, whether it's actually printed assets, uh, whatever the case may be. Like my goal is to make sure that whatever conversation that they're actually having at the event is as easy as possible and their ability, and this is what's really important, their ability to have the follow-up conversations, book the demos, schedule the appointments, whatever the case may be, is also simple from a technology standpoint. So like it's seamless where, uh, you know, I salespeople don't want to work too much to get the sale. And I don't mean that in a, in a very like a derogatory way, like they don't want to get bogged down in learning the technology. They don't want to get bogged down in trying to figure out like what the right steps are. So my goal is to make sure that that job is as easy as possible so that they can spend more time talking to people. Right. Fair, fair. And I, I largely agree with that, but I want to, um, maybe this is a little bit provocative. Is there for you, in your opinion, is there a line, right? Like I agree that, you know, I, as a marketer am a steward of pipeline, I'm at the service of my sales leaders. I want them to bring in revenue because ultimately that helps me. But at some point you're going to, and people listening to this, this conversation certainly have had this experience at some point, there's going to be a time where marketing feels like it knows better than the salesperson, right? Would you agree with that? Is that always the case? And if so, mm, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Finish. I no. Got... Like, I mean, what's 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 like? What should we be looking at as marketers? Because I agree. Maybe it's nine times out of ten. Maybe it's four. You know, less than that. 
that the what the sales team needs is what the sales team needs. But I think sure. that there are times where it's like, nope, this is our broader go-to-market strategy and we need you guys to be following this talk track or here's how we're starting to position things e yeah. based on environmental factors beyond you, the salesperson's conversations. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a really solid point. Um, one of the things we're working on, because we actually were struggling, um, especially at the beginning of this year, to like close some sales. And and later what we realized is like what I was saying from the marketing side was not matching what was being said on the sales side. Like there was a, a bit of a like differentiation between the talk tracks, as you will, between that. Um, we have actually made it a really strong point um, in the last three months to get more aligned. So what I say in marketing actually gets said on the sell side. And that actually requires a lot of training back and forth. And 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 partly because we are still trying um, and, and reevaluating all the different ways that we could present this product. Uh, one, topically, uh, mental health is a really broad topic. There's so much research. There's so much like actual journals, um, medical journals and things like that on how to approach mental health. I mean, you look at the different therapeutic styles that are out there that, that therapists can actually use. And that list is like a hundred different styles that can be blended or whatnot. And so when you start looking at all of that, it's like, well, how do we actually take this and make it into a cohesive track for people to understand? And, and what we realize is like, I think I found something that was working really well on the marketing side by getting people into the door, having the conversation. But what was being said at the marketing point um, at that macro communication level was not actually being echoed properly on the micro level. And, and when that was disjointed, we found that the sales were actually struggling to make the close. Uh, you know, we were confusing people um, and, and people like liked what we had to offer, but they were so confused uh, that it felt like it was a little bit going to be it's going to be a tricky transition to becoming an actual customer that the conversation kind of ended there. Uh, mm -hmm. We have gone through and, and we've started to adapt and understand like how to make that more efficient, how to make the conversation more efficient from top to bottom. And, and what that requires is me uh, to say, okay, this is how we talk about it at a macro level. This is how the conversation continues at a micro level. And our VP of sales, Cody has done a really great job at making sure that that, that, narrative is consistent through and through. And what's happened is in the last three months, really two months, as consistency has happened from the macro level to the micro level, uh, we are actually closing deals um, at a quicker rate than what we were before, uh, which is really good. Uh, people are less confused. They understand what the product is. Um, and, and what we're trying to do is just remove those barriers of confusion all the way down. Yeah. Is that, I mean, was that, was that process difficult? Was getting that alignment Difficult. And this is kind of a loaded question because I know the answer is generally <laughs> not easy for anyone. Sure, it, it can be. <laughs> and and again, um, especially where things may be a little bit more established within departments. Um, Cody, uh, our VP of Sales, and myself, we've got a great relationship, uh, and we are are just kind of tackling this together and trying to figure it out. And he'll come to me and say, "Hey, this this talk track doesn't work." And in fact, our CEO says, "I say it this way, and it seems to work really well." And our VP will say, uh, "We've actually stopped doing that because it was causing confusion here, here, and here, and now we've routed to this." And and everybody's just kind of on board to learn from each other uh, and grow. So in in this particular case, no, it wasn't actually, and it hasn't been very difficult to change the way we talk about things because it was very obvious, you know, uh, in Q2 and early Q1, like we just weren't closing deals. And so mm -hmm. it's when when people are like, oh, we're not getting the sales we want. It's easy for people to say, okay, let's figure out how to make this better. And and so we were all on board to figuring it out and and exploring together. And, and so. Not always the case, but in this case, Not it was for us. And that's, I think, I mean, uh, I've had really, really wonderful experiences with heads of sales as well. And when you guys are tightly aligned, and maybe we bring this back home, it makes it so much easier to create a great brand experience, right? When the sales and marketing want to do the same thing, when they're yeah. trying to march in the same direction. Oh, my God. It's just, it, I think it's just kind of kryptonite for unlocking that brand experience that I think a lot of companies struggle with. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It does. But like, again, as soon as I hang up on, on, on this podcast, I'm actually building a training deck for the sales team next week to walk them through like how we're going to talk about this product moving forward and, and some new research that came out and making sure that that research is understood in, in how our product works. So like uh, it, that's I feel like where I spend most of my time is just creating this like training material for internal people that then easily spins out to training external, you know, prospects and whatnot. So. You're fighting the good fight. Um, your sales team thanks you, I'm sure. Hey, it's Elizabeth, the producer of the Drift Podcast Network. I hope you're enjoying this episode of Revenue Talks. 
If you're looking for even more go-to-market best practices, check out our ebook, GTM Lab. You'll get go-to-market hot takes and secrets from the industry's brightest minds on how to ignite every phase of your strategy, giving you even more ways to energize your marketing and sales efforts. Give it a read at drift.ly slash gtmbook. Now, back to the show. Let's keep pulling the sales thread though for a minute because I think okay. there are a lot of not that maybe maybe this is good at turning into a little bit of sales or marketing um, you know therapy which I think is very on brand for, for you <laughs> um, I think there's a few like sources of I don't know misalignment or struggle or tension between sales and marketing I think one's the, the messaging alignment we just talked about mm-hmm. um, I think attribution is always a great place to start a big old fight that spins out of control. Yeah. And then I think the third one is the handoff, which you mentioned briefly about like wanting to create that, you know, that really, really easy transition from marketing to sales. Um, and so I want to hear your opinion on what makes that smooth. But I think also like let's set the definition, like what's your your definition of what like the quote unquote handoff between sales and marketing is or marketing and sales, I should say. Yeah, yeah. So, so one of the things I, I think most companies, it, it depends on, on where the definition lies. Uh, it's important to make sure that everybody understands where that that delineation is between where you know marketing is talking to the customer and where sales is talking to the customer. Uh, we we want to make it very clear, like, hey, right now this is in the sales court you know, the salesperson's court. So marketing is not going to like send any messaging at this point. And we make sure that that's pretty well known, right? Like when you are engaged and you tell us you're engaged by marking, you know, data fields X, Y, and Z as this, um, then I know very much so that you're talking to this person and, and marketing is not going to do anything. We're not going to send any newsletter. Like we'll send the newsletter. That's about it. That's the only monthly communication they'll get is just the general newsletter, but they won't get any of the nurture emails. They won't get anything else from us. Um, in, in that regard, they may see some ads or whatnot, but that's, that's a different story. Uh, what, what I think is the most difficult part is for us to understand like, Hey, this, this contact has fallen out of the sales process. It's either been delayed or they're not interested. They lost the opportunity. And, and that's when we don't um, actually get, I, I feel like marketing doesn't actually get notified well enough to understand that, okay, marketing, you're back in, right? It's you're, you're the main point moving forward. And so what we've done um, and what we're currently working on now is making sure that that point of, of re-engagement for marketing is, is more clearly identified. Uh, we've actually set a re-engagement date. So contacts who fall out of the sales process if they don't have a re-engagement date with sales, uh, then they just go through, you know, our normal nurture and, and, and marketing process at that point there. But our goal is actually to get most of the people who fall off the sales cycle a re-engagement date. And that re-engagement date is really important for us because then we're going to start a different communication path about six weeks before whatever that date is. And, and that will include one-on-one email uh, automation for uh, the salesperson to start you know, warming that lead back up so that they can re-engage whatever date that they were told to re-engage at. Um, but but we just need to make sure that those markers are very clearly identified. Like, hey, you know, even even if it's a, a three-month window, marketing's got three months to can, uh, continue to engage with them if that's what they want to do. Uh, and then sales, again, is going to try to re-hand off at, at this re-engagement date. Yeah. And and so we're, we're still trying to test out if that works. But the actual initial handoff, like we don't just gather leads and throw them over the fence and say, deal with it. Like that doesn't work. Uh, we try to make it a certain uh, like these clear points of like, OK, this is when sales is going to get engaged. And when sales is engaged, we're off. And then we're on until this date here. And then at the six week point, it's back on or whatever the case may be. And so really, I mean, it kind of comes back to what you spend a lot of your time doing is educating the sales team and being like, look, here are the rules of engagement. As long as we're all clear and we agree on it, yeah. you know, things should flow to yeah. and forth the way they should. Yeah. And, and communication. So so it's uh, like this is where the communication internally is really important. So I lay out a path of what I expect maybe to work really well. Uh, our VP of sales, Cody, he'll come back to me and say, this isn't going to work for us. And this is the reason why we brainstorm on how to make that a little bit better. I go to the technology team. I say, Hey, can we make this work this way? Whatever the case may be. They look at, uh, administrating our CRM to do those kind of functions. Uh, we go back, we kind of get all on board and we say, you know, uh, does this work? And so, so our, our marketing automation person is on board. Our sales team is on board. Um, you know, and then we start working on training everybody to make sure that they all understand. 
So this podcast is all about the alignment across all GTM functions and having spent some time at an employee wellness company myself, you know, the buyer was, you know, in my case, HR department, is that who's yep. your buyer as well? Yeah, yeah um, that's, that's where we start. But then the renewal is kind of dependent on the end users, right? Which were the employees? Are they engaging enough? Are they finding yeah. value out of it enough? And so, how does how does you and your how does you and your marketing team plug into that post purchase experience when you are all mm -hmm. of a sudden beholden to dozens, hundreds, thousands of end users of the body? This is where um, we start working now on the other side of the spectrum, right? So, like again, we want marketing. My my goal is to make sure marketing is involved in every touch point that a customer might might have with our product all the way from like using our product to actually going through the sales process. Um, so I do work with our customer success manager, our director there, um, and making sure that we can help her, you know, in any way possible. And I, I take that same approach. Like I just went and spent last week rebuilding all of the kickoff decks, the QBR decks, um, and, and the reporting decks so that she has something that's very much in line with the rest of our messaging across the board. So there's consistency there. Um, and then what we do is, try to figure out like what it would take for, you know, um, those components to be really easy. Now our, we have a really great, um, a product and so far, our, like our renewal rates been, you know, off the charts and we continue to grow. Uh, I technically have like a negative churn rate, um, in, in our product because Amazing. companies are growing and they're renewing at a higher rate than where they started at. So we ended up with a negative churn, uh, which is, which is great. Um, and, and the biggest thing that I'm trying to figure out, honestly, right now, um, and we just actually started having this conversation earlier this week. Well, we started a while ago, but we just renewed it again earlier this week is, is like, how do we actually get um, an advocacy program in place for these people? Um, and, and what we want to try to do is, is get people to not only acknowledge that they have access to Novati at the company. And, and most companies really like that because it helps with retention or whatever the case may be. But um, we want those companies to promote mental health as being important to them. And they're grateful that they have Novati to make that, you know, that a, a priority. And, and we do have customers that do that, but we're actually trying to help facilitate um, that particular message a, a little bit easier. Either giving them, you know, some social media kit or something that they can do with some, some canned messaging, like if they want to go that route. Um, but, you know, we also work really hard in making sure that we have training in place so that people can understand how to, uh, you know, train on, on mental health in, in the office. Um, and so sometimes what we'll do is actually work on getting, you know, health fair days or whatever the case may be, where the topic is mental health, get people really excited about the co topic of mental health, the fact that their company is involved in that concept, and then, and then give them the ability to spread that message that way. Uh, and that's what we're really trying to work through right now is, is understanding how can we get more out of our customers um, in promoting a concept of mental health uh, and a conversation around mental health outside of their company so which then feeds back into the brand brand affinity category right so i love yep, that you are exactly kind of right. like this perfect case study of how everything is interlinked on creating this brand affinity from the product to marketing to the sales experience of the pre-purchase experience mm -hmm. i should say the post-purchase experience all the way to rolling it out to the end users and making them then advocates for you as well which helps spread right like i mean it yeah. is all interconnected which is at once beautiful but also uh could be probably a little intimidating and terrifying it it for sure is overwhelming uh yeah. i would say like it's it's hard we're again a small team um and and pretty well connected across the board but at the same time like i know my content manager like is constantly pulling her hair out and god bless her she's amazing um uh, but like I ask her to like, hey, I need content for the customer success team to do X, Y, and Z. And she puts together like these emails to kind of promote whatever the mental health topic is and says, okay, now I need you to work with the product team to get an idea of what the latest content releases are going to be in the platform so we can match those type of content in, in terms of like the marketing content that we're going to create. And oh, by the way, we're also going to create a podcast that we would like to feed back to the customers uh, as well as for marketing purposes. And so I need you to manage that. And then on top of that, uh, I've got a couple of presentations I'm doing at this event next month that I need you to help me create. And, and my content manager, she's amazing. And she does all of this with a smile on her face. And I try really hard not to burn her out, but she loves it. And, and yeah. uh, but our content creation is just like, across the board, um, touching different people. Um, and, yeah. and that's what we're constantly doing. Bless your doing. content manager. If she's able to get those things to reverberate, like find that resonant frequency together across all these different touch points, 
inputs i think that's just like i mean that's that's the making of like a monstrous marketing machine so i have yeah. high hopes yeah yeah thank you we're i we're making great progress but there's so much more work to be done for sure yeah uh, all right, David, um, we're coming up on the half an hour. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you with the okay. final question, which is the signature revenue talks question. And that is this. What is the number one thing that your team is focused on to accelerate revenue? There's a couple things that we're doing. Um, I'll give you I'll give you two. Um, so first and foremost, like we, we've talked about this, we've hinted at this. I We have a very mission focused marketing approach. Our goal is to get people to talk about mental health in the company. Um, and, and really start to like break down that stigma that's associated with mental health. And, and so everything we do from a marketing perspective is really designed to help break down that stigma. Uh, one of the big things we're doing um, on the website, so uh, we are going to rebuild um, our HR training modules on the website. So what we have been... St- what we started to do earlier this year, and now we're going to try to take it to the nth degree, is actually do um, training modules and, and teach managers. What we find is like managers, when the conversation of mental health comes up, like managers freeze like deer in a spotlight. Like they don't know how to have the conversation. It scares the hell out of them. And they're like, uh, go talk to HR, which is the wrong answer. But I did it totally guilty. That's how I managed for a couple of years uh, when I really didn't have the idea, like I didn't know what to do. And so we've actually spent a lot of time training managers on how to have this conversation inside and outside of, of customers of Novati, right? And and so we are putting a lot of emphasis in creating content around training HR executives, training HR teams, and training management teams across the board, it doesn't matter what department you're in, on how to have a conversation around mental health. So you're going to see this huge explosion of training modules coming out that are going to be totally free for, for managers. And we're really excited about what that actually is going to look like. Um, so there's a, that's the emphasis on the content side that really per, uh, perpetuates our, our mission-oriented uh, goal in marketing. Um, and then the other thing that we're really working on is actually uh, technology partnerships. We're looking at HRIS software and other um, partners who have similar uh who have similar audiences that they're going after, but not necessarily competitive, but yet very mm-hmm. complementary to each other. Um, and we do a lot in terms of, of trying to engage their audiences with our audience um, and, and vice versa. And so it's really great as like, there's a, there's a good company that does, uh, you know, uh, motivational type components within uh, companies. And, and so what we'll do is we'll talk, we'll talk with them on like a, a, something that works together. So for example, uh, they talk about gratitude and, and the effects gratitude can have in the office and what that actually looks like towards mental health. And so uh, if the conversation's around gratitude, we talk about like what the mental health play is around gratitude. They talk about what the motivational component is around gratitude. And together, uh, I now am in contact with their audience and their audience is now in contact with Navadi. And uh, we just all of a sudden really like grew our ability to touch people that we haven't touched who are the ideal market, who've been kind of like uh, promoted to by another company um, who's reaching out to the same audiences. And now all of a sudden our brand is introduced to a lot of target audience members uh, without actually having to go like too far outside of that. And, And we have, again, a luxury with mental health. It's a very broad topic and there's a lot of ways to spin it, but that gives us an opportunity to really, you know, work and collaborate with a lot of different companies, which we like to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if you're not in uh, the wellness space, you know, I think the, the, the Rosetta Stone is lead with value, right? Give great content yeah. and value up front. They'll come back for more. They'll remember you. And then partnerships, like, I, you know, partnerships are so important this day and age, especially with the noisy marketplace we're in. Um, David Malmberg from Navadi, thank you so much for joining us. Everybody check out Navadi. They're doing really great things to help your employee group with their mental health. Um, It was an honor and a pleasure to have you on Revenue Talks today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the time. Thank you so much for listening to Revenue Talks. If you liked this episode, please consider leaving a review wherever you're listening. You can connect with me on Twitter at Justin Keller and the entire Drift Podcast Network at at Drift Podcasts. Remember, revenue, it's everyone's business now. 